What, what do you think is the distinguishing factor here? I think St. Lucia has much more to offer than a passport. The Global Passport Investor is your go-to podcast. Welcome to the latest podcast of the Global Passport Investor. I'm your host, Eric Major, an industry veteran with over three decades in the game. This is the latest in the series of talks that we're going to be having on citizenship, on residency, and all things investment migration. If you're watching us on YouTube, please leave us your questions in the comment section. And for those of you listening to the podcast, we invite you to leave your emails and your queries at questions at globalpassportinvestor.com. So today we're going to be speaking about St. Lucia Citizenship by Investment. And before we meet our very special guest, I'd like to go over a bit of background. First of all, where is St. Lucia? Well, it's a Caribbean island that's part of the Windward Group of the Glacier and Tile area. And they have about 24 miles away from Martinique, 21 miles northeast of St. Vincent. Uh, and every December, I understand, you have this Rodney Bay where you see the conclusion of the ARC or the Atlantic Rally for Cruisers uh, with sailors and, and, and racing over 2,700 nautical miles from the starting point of uh, the Canary Islands all the way to, uh, to St. Lucia. Now, let's move on to the topic at hand. We're going to be talking about citizenship by investment. Our readers and listeners would have heard me say that this is uh, a, a process under uh, under one back scratching another where an investor is itching for citizenship and the island is itching for foreign direct investment and there are practitioners such as ourselves who bring them both together to scratch each other's back okay so now let's meet our very special guest McLeod Emmanuel you're the CEO of St. Lucia Citizenship by Investment uh, unit and I'm really pleased to have you at the show. Welcome. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you to your to your listeners. Thank you for having me. Great. And you just came in uh, after a long flight. How are you feeling? Um, uh, I'm, I feel a bit tired, but I'm, I think I'm energized by just being among um, our our stakeholders in in the Dubai region. It's always a pleasure to meet you persons face to face. I know with with technology you can speak now via video call and voice over IP, but there's nothing more effective than having a handshake and meeting someone yeah. face to face. So happy to be at your office right here, and and hopefully we can have a fruitful discussion where we can share information about Inusha's program to your listeners, and hopefully they can see Inusha in in a, in, a, in a different light. Excellent. Well, you know, I was doing my due diligence on you, just like you do on your applicants. And I came to understand that you have some experience with this world of interviews and, and uh, you had a background in radio. Yes. So I, I hope this environment feels uh, somewhat familiar to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is that background? So were you a radio show host? Or? No, no. I was never in front of the camera. However, in my previous life, I was a general manager of the national radio station and I also yeah. manage a privately owned um, radio and television network. So I've had a few years experience within the media. Um, so it's it's good to be to be amongst, this uh, environment. Um, amongst the environment. <laughs> so it feels so it's like a, a, a welcome home um, for me. So I'm enjoying it. Great. Well yeah. listen I, I know what we're gonna be speaking about is slightly a different world uh, than the, the media world that you're familiar with, but you're also very familiar about citizenship by investment, yes. albeit St. Lucia being the uh, latest and uh, latest entrant into this field, which you are now heading. Um, could you tell the listeners and viewers, how would you uh, describe the evolution of this program, which is how many years now in, in the making? Um, or in just, the, just about eight years now. Eight years already, see, time just flies. About eight years. But how, how did it come about? What was that journey in St. Lucia? In St. Lucia. So St. Lucia is one is, is the youngest of the five Caribbean CBI programs. There are programs in St. Kitts, Dominica, Antigua, and Grenada. St. Lucia is the baby of the program. For the longest while, St. Lucia was um, uh, an industry that was primarily oriented to agriculture. As times evolved and we lost preferential treatment and the world became a more, a more even playing field, we went into the tourism and off offshore financial services sector. St. Lucia has done extremely well in the tourism sector, currently um, being um, awarded the, the title of the world's honeymoon, leading honeymoon destination for approximately 10 years in a row. More recently, we, we won the award as the world's leading adventure destination. So St. Lucia is definitely a place for, for all to come to visit and to enjoy. This, the CBI industry, allows us to 
pivot and exploit the possibilities of our tourism product into a new industry. Mm. Whilst at the core of the, the CBI industry is providing mobility and other opportunities for, for investors, we believe St. Lucia can offer so much more. Mm -hmm. So we've created a, an acronym called VIBE, we call Visit, Invest, Build, Establish. Mm -hmm. We believe St. Lucia is more than just a location for a passport. Mm -hmm. We believe that we have access to the world's biggest markets. We have direct flights to Miami, to New York, to Atlanta, to Canada, to the UK every single day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes multiple flights to these major cities. Mm -hmm. We have been ranked favorably on the ease of doing business. Mm -hmm. St. Lucia is a democratic country where there's free and fair elections. Mm. It's a relatively safe country. It's a country filled with potential, whether in the tourism, the Airbnb market, the other forms of real estate endeavors. So there's so much to offer for St. Lucians, whether it be St. Lucians by birth or economic citizens. And that's why we try to leverage that strong brand and, and invite you to St. Lucia. Well, tell me if you're a foreign national who's convinced by everything you, you just said, which is quite a compelling proposition, uh, what do they have to do? What are the investment options? What are the commitments they have to make in order to become a St. Lucian? So St. Lucian has, has four investment options. One can become a St. Lucian via investing in either one of these four routes. So you have the donation where you, where you invest a minimum 100,000 US dollars into the National Economic Fund. This fund is designed to provide relief to relief and or support to youth and sports development, create social safety nets, and overall social development in the country. You also have the real estate route for a minimum of US $200,000. This route allows the country to partner with investors, almost like a private-public partnership arrangement, where they show the their ability to invest in a property, but we also provide them with the infrastructure of this industry to help raise additional capital for that endeavor. Mm -hmm. You also have government bonds. St. Lucia has a good reputation of, of repaying on its bonds. We have a stellar record, we always repay on our bonds. So the bond option called a national action bond for a minimum of US $300,000 and an administrative fee of $50,000, irrespective of how big your family is from one to 50, you're now able to to lend the country money, five years, zero interest, but you get your principal back. Mm -hmm. So if you have excess liquidity, and perhaps you don't want to invest directly in the NEF, National Economic Fund, albeit a lower threshold, you may decide to, for five years, you know what, put my money aside to the government of St. Lucia, we interview that money, invest it in various means, and you get your principal back with no interest. And the fourth and little used one is the enterprise. Mm -hmm. It's one where we have set out some critical needs of the country, where it be roads, highways, um, feeder roads for agriculture um, um, zones. And we, we seek partnerships for persons who are willing to provide the financing mm -hmm. to, 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 to effect changes and improvements in these infrastructural areas. Um, this has been a seldom used investment option. However, we have done some tweaks to it, and hopefully next year we'll see a, 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 a some, some, some uptick within the enterprise function. Right, so as, as more and more people mm -hmm. consider uh, CBI also from a lifestyle relocation point of view, I would agree that could be interesting. So before we move to our next question, I want to remind our YouTube viewers to leave their questions in the comments section. Indeed. And if you're listening to the podcast, feel free to email questions at globalpassportinvestor.com. The greatest investment you could ever make is an investment in your future. Rift Trust and Latitude Group is the leading provider of residency and citizenship solutions for high net worth individuals. Our clients are like our extended family. We're a global firm with a local focus. What makes us truly unique is our leadership team. 100 years of combined industry experience and we're working every day with governments to improve and build new residency and citizenship programs. Obtaining a second residence or citizenship is the best modern insurance policy for you and your family. Our clients expect the world. We, we deliver. deliver it. Hello, Hello to freedom. So, okay, we, we have five Eastern Caribbean countries and islands that are offering citizenship by investment, right? So you've said that your, St. Lucia was the fifth. So what makes St. Lucia stand out from the crowd in your mind? knowing that you have four very able uh, competitors at, uh, by your side. What, what, what do you think is the distinguishing factor here? I Saint think St. Lucia has much more to offer than a passport. Mm. Um, 
to be to be quite honest, we abhor this the notion that Indonesian citizenship is just for a passport. We believe as a country, the level of pride that we have, we have so much more to offer. St. Lucia has the world's only driving volcano. St. Lucia has the most Nobel laureates per capita, a country population of only 180,000 people. We've had two Nobel laureates, one in economics, mm. that's Arthur Lewis, and the one in literature, that's the Derek Walcott. Mm. So St. Lucia are people rich of history. We've been seven times British, seven times French, and this these different cultures have infused into one makeup of Sinusha as a people. So with that being said, along with other e economic opportunities to invest in real estate, to own timeshares, to to um invest in value-added services within the agricultural sector, to invest in the insurance sector. We believe that Sinusians or economic citizens who only get this passport to say, I'm a Sinusian passport, we, 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 we abhor this. We believe there's so much more to do with a Sinusian passport. So that's why we have refrained from speaking about visa-free access mm -hmm. or, or stay six months in particular territories. This is the least of the benefits. I believe the benefit, the core benefit of St. Lucia is really to visit and to invest and to build and establish yourself as a true authentic St. Lucian. So that's what we make sure. Your, your passion, I can see our yes. listeners are also feeling this, uh, yes. which is great, which is great. I, but wh where is this message in your mind, uh, or to whom is it resonating? Uh, we all know that in the past, uh, massive and important markets from China and the in the Middle East have been great um, you know, uh, applicants for these type of programs. But is there anything that's evolved in your view in the last three years that maybe some surprises or, or newcomers uh, that are really discovering St. Lucia? What, or is that mix still very much uh, regional? Uh, I, I think what happened in the past few years was COVID. Yes. COVID happened. And for the first time, persons were for, for, for forced to, to work within the confines of their home. Yes. Or, or at least remotely. And with that happening, persons realize that, you know what, I can really work from a paradise. And we saw an upsurge in the, 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 the demand for St. Lucia, particularly in the North American markets yes, yes. during the COVID period, because persons now could it's have- a lifestyle it's, a life, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. How about you with your laptop, Wi-Fi by the beach, yeah, drinking they, coconut they, water? They realize they don't have to be in Manhattan. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So I think this, these are some of the, the yeah. reasons why, why people were drawn to St. Lucia. So I think that's one of the biggest um, shifts in patterns we realized. It was packed by COVID. Okay, I mm. think that's a, mm. a very uh, valid point that we've seen um, in other markets as well. And it's, mm. let's face it, it's changed the way we live and we do business. Yes, um, and I think in many ways it's brought some really positive change from that perspective, despite the tremendous uh, challenges that it brought to the world. Now, you mentioned, I mean, everyone knows St. Lucia and the Caribbean as a whole. Tourism is a very important component of, uh, of the local economy. Um, how does that compare for citizenship by investment? How significant is this program uh, in terms of its, you know, its representation in the overall budget or mm -hmm. economy? Um, and is that something that you see falling or growing in, in the years ahead? Um, unlike some of our other territories, St. Lucia's CBI program does not contribute as much to the overall GDP. I know there are two of the, the Caribbean CBI programs that contribute over 50% mm. of the country's GDP. Mm. In St. Lucia, we are on 10%. Oh, really? Only so, that? Yeah, okay. so, so, we so you wouldn't so, say you're dependent on it? No, so we're not dependent on it. Mm. I think our to, to, tourism industry is our mainstay. Mm. So a lot of our our GDP growth and expansion occurs within the tourism sector, whether it be expansion in the number of room stock, in our country's room stock, or, or the linkages created through the tourism for our fishers and our farmers. So, so tourism is the mainstay for us as a country. Obviously, the financial services sector does generate some, some returns for us and create some expansion opportunities, but we are not as heavily dependent on CBI as other territories because, as I mentioned, we have so much more to offer. Mm -hmm. So in some other territories, this may be what, I mean, what that, that may be the only true value proposition, mm -hmm. CBI, but this is just to us 
one out of a portfolio of so much of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting, and, and, and I think for some investors that will be an appealing plight, but uh, in the end, it's it's a question of where they want to be and where they want to go. You've been um, running this program for eight years, but let's face it, and our readers and, and um, listeners would have uh, read occasional uh, articles here and there uh, talking about the industry, its future. You know, we know uh, that uh, Brussels and the UK have had reviews of certain of these programs, uh, and there's question in the industry, is this something that's going to be around for much longer? So we know it's been uh, eight years, eight great years, I'm sure, for St. Lucia. Are we talking eight more months? Eight more years or eight more decades of CBI, as far as you're concerned. What do you think? Um, I mean, no one, no one can adequately predict the future, because no one a few years ago could have told that we would have experienced a, a pandemic that would cause us mm. to change the way we live and the way we work. So, I mean, the, the world is a dynamic place, mm -hmm. and there are forever moving pieces to every industry. However, I believe that in the case of Saint Lucia, we have maintain our our standard for due diligence mm -hmm. and we aim to provide as robust a due diligence process as we can so every single applicant that we vet we ensure that we understand the full kyc know your customer and we go in depth so that when somebody is granted we believe we have the the least possible risk of this individual being a potential individual that is not wanted by one of our you know, I like territories. Mm -hmm. Obviously, no one can tell the future, mm -hmm. but I believe um, it, is, it is imperative for us to continue dialoguing with our stakeholder partners, yes. um, being open and transparent to them about our processes. Because, you know, oftentimes, um, Eric, people doubt scripts in and, and concerns creep in when you have limited knowledge or information about something. So I believe by us being open and transparent, it gives us an opportunity to explain our processes, mm -hmm. show you how we cross our T's and how we dot our I's. Mm -hmm. And I believe if we continue to do so, we can have a sustained um, industry to be enjoyed by all. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I, I truly believe that it, uh, it will evolve. The bar will over time be raised mm -hmm. um, as these questions and interventions come into play. And, um, and as these uh, other external stakeholders uh, want to see, uh, you know, again, the, 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 that these programs be well administered and managed. Yeah. Now, in the same vein, uh, however, um, you know, we have clients who investigate uh, these measures and these opportunities. They look at what you've described as the four options. And there's, you know, risk return that comes into mind. There's capital outlay and, and um, whether one gets their investment back. And there's all these considerations versus, let's say, a donation. And your National Economic Fund is obviously the recipient of that donation, and uh, the amount you pay depends on the size of the family. But there's also been some, some would say, innovation by certain uh, participants in your real estate option where a developer says, oh, you're looking for real estate, I'm going to offer you an investment in real estate because that's permissible, right? Yes. Um, and, and the investment thresholds there are typically uh, more elevated, and in fact, 200,000, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is that, you know, could with some product innovation, as we have seen in this particular developer's case, uh, where financing is being brought to bear and presented to the client, where the all-in cost could challenge the National uh, Economic Fund or the donation route. Uh, you know, the market knows this, the government ought and clearly should know this, you mm -hmm. as the CEO I'm sure know this as well. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem? Is that uh, okay? W what's your view on this? I mean, for, from, our, from our vantage point, we ensure that we sell at the mandated prices. So legislatively, donation 100, real estate 200, bonds 300, etc. And there are various tiers for the, the enterprise. We, however, do know that um, there are commercial agreements that are done with developers and promoters to sell at particular price points. And for us, what, what we do, we ensure that um, as, per, as per the development of the necessary accounts, the S3 accounts, we ensure that we see the requisite growth that corresponds to each applicant. Mm -hmm. and, and so far, we've been seeing it at the 
price that we legislated and so so that that provides us with comfort and, and ease of mind but but you you've heard it um and you've seen some prices banded around some of them i i think are deliberately done to malign the country because i think as anything else this is a business environment and you know it can be a little cutthroat yes at times and people <laughs> sometimes especially if you're if you're growing product um persons may seek to differentiate themselves by trying to slander your brand, mm. um, but St. Lucia would not engage in that because we believe that our proposition is strong enough mm. to weather any particular storm or criticism. But definitely we've, we've heard about it and what we've also been doing, any promoter who is seen promoting below the legislated prices have been blacklisted. Okay. So you go to our website www.cipsenusha.com, S-A-I-N-T-L-U-C-I-A.com and there's a blacklist tab and we have blacklisted promoters who we've we'll seen outside. have flyers selling Sinusha product at less than the legislated prices. Mm -hmm. So we have done that. And in other cases, we have provided cautions to persons. Mm -hmm. And these are first warnings. Failure to adhere would cause them to also be blacklisted. And the and they, they licenses would, would not be renewed. So so we are taking measures internally to mitigate so this. So, McLeod, if I'm hearing you, and that's, that's fair. Everything you've just said makes a lot of sense. But what you're saying uh, in clear terms is, there needs to be 200000 in escrow in a developer's account, uh, and the CIA needs to be satisfied by that yeah. before uh, COR or certificates and, yes, and yes, passports can be yes, issued. Yes. And then after that, 200000 makes its way to the construction and the development of that project yes. to escrow agreements. Yes. So you're saying you guys are satisfied that no matter what's being said out there yes. and whatever was being signed out there, yeah. because these are commercial matters, as yes, you say, yes. The CIU, sh yeah. I would say, should be in, ha be accountable uh, accountable to seeing that two hundred thousand yes, for indeed. each applicant. Indeed, okay. indeed, indeed. So as long as that's happening, indeed. I'll tell you as a banker for twenty two years, uh, I don't mm. have a problem with that because I made my career selling Canadian immigrant investor program with financing. Oh. Uh, okay. uh, right, and that's that's what we did uh, in, in nice, the banks that nice I work things. for, and it was a big component of our of our business. And so there's nothing wrong with financing, so long as the government gets what it's supposed to get. Indeed, right, Indeed. Sydney. Sydney. Okay, so we're we're um, we're clear on that. Well, listen, I I, um, I think we're at the part of the show which we call this anecdota time, where we try to loose, okay. loosen things up a little bit here. Imagine we're having a, maybe a, a a nice little rum punch, um, <laughs> something uh -huh. of that, say by. by by your beaches there, What's yeah. Up? In fact, I wish I wish that was what uh, our friend Cat could have served us <laughs> earlier. But given the time of day, Cat, make a note. But otherwise, uh, McLeod, I want you to share I don't know, an anecdote, a story. I mean, you you have an interesting career background. You yeah. have also uh, a very important role to play. You must see very interesting applicants and applications you deal with government you deal with practitioner you also may have something that's unique or, or funny in your own personal right is there something you'd like to share with the audience that uh, either either touches on you uh, st lucia or the ciu or this business of ours um i mean what what i mean i don't know how funny it is but, but it's what, a family show by the way yeah. no 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 <laughs> no definitely this is a rated rated pg a pg please for sure um as you um stay in the program longer and you review and sign up for an applications mm. sometimes um during your downtime you look at the profile yes of an applicant yes i.e the family size, the number of children, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Yeah. and you could even you could almost tell what region that that, that they come from. That's so so That's oftentimes you know persons will have huge families and have seven children are yes. normally Middle Eastern. Yes, yes. Uh, in a, uh, in a region, yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, and a lot of times some some are the single applicants, so if or if one child, so that could be Chinese. Yes, Chinese so, exactly. so so you just I mean during your downtime you just almost like. I wonder, hmm, based yeah, on this, uh, let me see what Mr. X is. I think he's probably from X territory. And sometimes you actually correct just based on the trend that you see. Yeah. So That's yeah. an interesting story. And, and I, I remember um, in my earlier career, uh, both doing Canada, we, the, the, the bank I was working for wanted to understand this demographics. And mm -hmm. we did some research. And typically for residency, there were larger families because it was a true migration. Mm -hmm. But then got into the citizenship by investment world. And, and we'd come to these averages in the early years 
where the average application had 1.7, not even two people. So it was really a single applicant kind of world. But then it opened up, and this is back in the day, that only a few markets were involved. This is 15 years ago. Today, you're right, you have, in certain, like we have an office in Nigeria, and the Nigerian seems to have big family uh, constituents, and they have big families. Here in Dubai as well, with our, our, our case processing team, some of these families, they have massive you know, paperwork involved because of the children. So you, there are these, um, these traits in certain markets, but um, it's truly a global business though, eh? I mean, you talked Indeed. about America, you talk about uh, China. Yes. Uh, I mean, there's, uh, would you even have an idea of how many countries uh, have expressed interest in terms of the, their application, the applicant's nationality? They, uh, how many nationalities do you think you would have served over the years? I think I think You're probably over a hundred. Oh, definitely over a hundred. I think I think with the exception of um, Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, yeah. North, I, North Korea, North Korea. <laughs> I think I think every territory, every every territory. Every territory. I, I believe. So it. if if the world has say one hundred ninety four countries, I would say if we say about one hundred ninety, wow. at least one hundred eighty five at the minimum okay. have all yeah. shared interests. Amazing. So we found at least one from every corner of the globe. Yes. Yeah. And it's not a great thing for any nation to embrace. So, McLeod, I'm going to leave it there and thank you very much for your time and for coming to thank join you. us. Thanks, you were a fantastic guest. Listeners and viewers, I'm going to ask you to stay tuned for the next Global Passport Investor where we'll continue to talk and walk you through the world of investment migration. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I, I told you one thing. I told you one thing. <laughs> We're not going back again. <laughs>